Amen. Praise the Lord. Beautiful Amen. song. Um, trust God today and tomorrow for He's all that we need for sure. That's 100% uh, factual. And I pray that that's the experience of all of our hearts and our walks in Christ. That every day we will be trusting, believing Him, and recognizing that He's everything that we need. Well, today we're going to go ahead and jump into, a, 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 I think, an interesting topic. As we get into God's Word for midday, I pray that it will be a blessing to each and every one of us. We're actually going to be looking at a topic entitled, Who Killed Korah? Dathan and Abiram. This has been a mystery to many for so many, many years. You know, and many people look at God in a certain light because of incidences like this. I mean, uh, we heard a beautiful study just now uh, regarding God's character. And so it is very crucial for us. And like Sister Leslie said, these are life-changing things. This helps us to look at scripture uh, more profoundly. It gives it a new meaning, a, a clear meaning, so that there is no doubt in our hearts, there's no dark, doubt in our minds that God is good all the time. So we're going to get right into it. There's a lot to share. I'm going to try to uh, fit this into two presentations. Um, I'm going to try. It's a lot of uh, information. So I might be moving a little fast, but I'm not going to move too fast because I want the Holy Spirit to guide me, and we're going to pray for that right now. And we want to also not uh, do a disservice to this presentation. So I invite you to bow your heads with me now. I, again, I thank God for giving me this privilege to be with you all today on this beautiful Sabbath day where God has brought us together to learn and to uh, let His truth sanctify us. And so, I just invite you to pray with me now as we invite the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much again for your wonderful love and your mercy and your, your guidance. Lord, you have truly been filling us with truths that are amazing. We pray, dear God, that these truths will, will work out their effect in our life, that it will change our hearts, that it will soften our stony hearts, and remove every rough edge of our characters as we realize and recognize that you are nothing like the human nature is totally different as you have told us your ways are not our ways but your ways and your thoughts are higher as high as the heavens are to earth that's the contrast between your ways and our ways help us dear God to understand your ways and understand the way you think to, to, to the highest degree that we could here on earth so that we can start thinking like you do, so that we can receive your mind and we can receive your character so that we can do you a justice in your service. So dear Father, we invite your Holy Spirit to be with us. We invite your angels to continue to surround us and protect us. Lord, keep our minds focused as we get into this because there's a lot of material here. I pray, dear God, that those are, that are listening may even grab a pen or pad and take notes. Write down the quotations. Go back and study these things because these are some serious topics. Serious things that you are unraveling to us. Which have been mysteries for thousands of years. So, dear Father, speak to us now. Use me as your mouthpiece. Lord, empty me of self. Remove from me fear and self and everything that would prevent you from being able to uh, communicate to us the way you would uh, you, what your ideal will would be and so dear father we thank you for we surrender this time to you we surrender our hearts to you speak to us now we pray in jesus name amen i'm not going to be doing a powerpoint i'm just going to be sharing this is why i'm saying you might want to take some notes uh, I can share the transcript later, but anyway, we're going to be looking at who killed Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Again, we're looking at that important topic. Now, we're going to start looking at certain aspects, right? Because we know that they went down alive into the pit. 
they went down alive into the pit. Right? For the descendants of Korah, there's some words that, that we find in Psalm 88, which must have a much deeper meaning than most people would actually appreciate. So we're going to start off with that scripture. We're going to start off with Psalm 88, and we're going to be reading verses 2 to 8. We're going to decipher this event. We're going to look at many details and principles to understand what actually happened here in the event of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. So Psalm 88, two, two verses, uh, chapter 88, verses 2 to 8 says, Let my prayer come before thee. Incline thine ear unto my cry. For my soul is full of troubles, and my life draweth nigh unto the grave. I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that has no strength, free among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more. And they are cut off from thy hand. Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the deeps. Thy wrath lieth hard upon me, and thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves. Selah. Thou hast put away mine acquaintance far from me. Thou hast made me an abomination unto them. I am shut up, and I cannot come forth. Think about the men that went down into the pit. Think about if, if any of them, think about, think about if any of them, uh, uh, think about these words in, in regards to their, you know, their experience. Now, the story of Korah and his associates serves a striking reminder of the price of rebellion. It must have been a trying experience for the sons of Korah to have to live with an inheritance akin to Cain and Balaam. In Jude chapter 1 and verse 11, in verse 11 it says, Woe unto them! For they have gone in the way of Cain and ran, and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward. And notice here, and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. That word Kor is another word for Korah. Think about it. Woe well, unto them who have gone in the way, the way of Cain in the error of Balaam and perished like Korah. Now imagine Psalm 88 as if it was one of the psalms written by one of the sons of Korah. Think about it for a minute. We can only imagine how painful were the words, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. Although this son of Korah may have never participated in the rebellion of his father or his forefathers, he would have been regularly reminded that his family served as a constant reminder of the wrath of God against the rebellious. And wrath of God, we're going to look at that in a certain context. We're going to look at the real context of that as we get into this study a little bit deeper. So it is fitting then that these words also apply to Christ. These words also apply to Christ who took upon himself our inheritance and was accounted with them who go down into the pit. Let us examine then the story of Korah that we might understand what it tells us about the judgments of God. Because this is a subject that has most people in, uh, looking at God in the wrong light. And I mean most, the majority. So let's go now to Numbers chapter 16. We're going to start looking at the story of Korah. Numbers chapter 16 verses 1 to 11. Now Korah the son of Ishar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, and the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy. Every one of them are holy. And the Lord is among them. 
Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. Listen to what they were telling Moses. These men were counting the congregation as holy. Every one of them. And we read so many things that happened to the children of Israel. Uh, you know, in, in their wilderness wanderings. Which showed that they were not all holy. But these men were, de were deluded. And they were claiming every single person is holy. But you, Moses, you're lifting up yourself above the congregation of the Lord. And when Mo so, and then it says here, and when Moses heard this, he f notice how Moses reacted, by the way. And when Moses heard these accusations, he fell upon his face. And he spake unto Korah and unto all his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his, and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him, even him whose, whom he has chosen will he cause to come near unto him. Now let me ask you, what happens when we come near to God? We're protected. Notice here, this do, Moses says, take your censers, Korah, and all his company, and put fire therein, and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the men or the man whom the Lord does choose, he shall be holy. Or in other words, he should be, he would be, uh, this would be evidence that he's the one that is among the holy, covered under God's holiness. Because ye take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi. Now Moses turns the table. He says, no, it is you. It is you who take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi. And Moses said unto Korah, Here I pray you, ye sons of Levi, seemeth it but a small thing unto you, that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them? What is Moses doing? He's trying to remind them that they were called to be God's holy. He's telling them, No, you are the one who is not holy. But God has called you to be holy. God has called you for a mission. He's trying to remind them, don't go that way, brethren. You're going in danger. Notice what he continues to remind them. And God has brought thee near to him. And all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, Levi with thee. And seek ye the priesthood also. For which cause both you and all thy company are gathered together. Notice now what he says to them. Because they were coming against Moses uh, in their mind, right? But notice what Moses tells them. For which cause both you and your company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that ye murmur against him? In other words, you're not murmuring against men. We're just instruments in God's hands. We're nobody. You're arguing against God. Be careful, brethren. Remember where God has brought you from. This is what Moses was telling Korah, Datham, and Abiram, and all of their company. So let's take a look at some factors, brethren, leading to their rebellion. We want to know what happened. In Review and Herald, November 12, 1903, Inspiration says this. Korah and his fellow conspirators were men who had been favored with special manifestations of God's power and greatness. They were of the number who went up with Moses into the mount and beheld the divine glory. So these men were not just any men. These men were, they had special privileges and honors from God. They were, the one, they were actually up in the mount with, God, with Moses. They had to stay at a lower level, but they were up there. They were closer than all the rest of the congregation to God. In Testimonies, Volume 3, page 354, paragraph 2, we're told the following. But there in their tents boldly stood Korah, the instigator of the rebellion, and his sympathizers as if in defiance of God's wrath, as though God had never wrought through his servant Moses. They had seen all of the miracles that God had done through Moses. But now they're pretending as if they never, that 
none of that came from God. That no, Moses was trying to puff himself up and be a dictator. It goes on to say, and much less did these rebellious ones act as though they had been so recently honored of God by being brought with Moses almost directly into his presence and beholding his unsurpassed glory. These men saw Moses come down from the mount after he had received the second tables of stone and while his face was so resplendent with the glory of God that the people would not approach him. These men had special honors. It continues. But what happened? Korah was not satisfied with his position. Does that give us a little bit of a whiplash? Do we, do we remember something like that taking place in heaven? Was there a being in heaven that had everything? Special privileges? But was not satisfied with his position? What are we seeing in Korah? We are seeing the very same issue that rose up in Lucifer when he was Lucifer. Lucifer became dissatisfied with his position. He wanted more even though he had all. Korah was not satisfied with his position even though he was at a high position but he wasn't satisfied. Inspiration goes on to say he was connected with the service of the tabernacle yet he desired to be exalted to the priesthood. God had established Moses as chief governor and the priesthood was given to Aaron and his sons. Korah determined to compel Moses to change the order of things that he might be raised to the dignity of the priesthood. To be more sure of accomplishing his purpose, notice what Korah did. He drew Dathan and Abiram, descendants of Reuben, into his rebellion. You know, I want to pause here for a minute because this also applies to many people in church services or even in family circles. God has given an established um, order of things in the family, an order of things in the church, and every position is important. This is a good lesson for us in this study. That's why I want to pause for a minute, because we have to really uh, galvanize this point, or this lesson. We, as God's children, or professed children of God, right? We have to learn, brethren, to be satisfied where in whatever place we find ourselves no matter what because soon we might find ourselves in a dungeon or in a prison because of our faith and if we don't learn now in the time of rele uh, relevant uh, ease you know it's pretty much ease you know right now even though it seems a little bit difficult right but you can really consider this a time of ease still because it's not really to those high levels that we're going to experience soon but if we don't find ourselves satisfied in whatever place we find ourselves recognizing that God is in control because we have given him total control of our life we too are going to become dissatisfied if we're not satisfied in being you know having a certain position you know for instance sometimes you even have this among the genders women want to be men or men want to be women or the children want to control the parents. Or church members want to control the church. You know, everyone has a position. Everyone has, there's an order for everyone. And according to the way we uh, utilize the gifts and talents that God has given to us, God continues to promote. Right? He promotes. He, was, he promoted Lucifer to the highest position in heaven. But he still became dissatisfied because he didn't learn the lesson of being satisfied Resting, You see that spirit of rest? Resting in wherever we find ourselves, knowing that if we've given our life to God, then let thy will be done, not mine. Korah was not satisfied. He drew these other brethren into his rebellion. In the rebellion of Korah is seen the working out upon a narrower stage of the same spirit that led to the rebellion of Satan in heaven. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 403, paragraph 3. It was pride and ambition 
that prompted Lucifer to complain of the government of God and to seek the overthrow of the order which had been established in heaven. Now, what was the issue that opened the way for the rebellious career of Korah? What was it? What happened to him? Patriarchs and Prophets, page 396, paragraph 1 says, They were unwilling to submit to the terrible sentence. Listen to this very carefully, brethren. They were unwilling to submit to the terrible sentence that they must all die in the wilderness. And hence they were, all, they were ready to seize upon every pretext for believing that it was not God but Moses who was leading them and who had pronounced their doom. You know, you know that many things that God predicts, they're conditional. They depend upon us. You know, when God went to uh, send Jonah to the Ninevites, you know, surely they were going to be destroyed. That was the message. You're going to all die. The Ninevites says, oh no. Oh, we messed up. We, it's our fault. They realized that the issue was with them. And they were pushing away God's protection. They, they realized there was something that was wrong with them. They realized that they needed God. They needed His protection. That all protection comes from the true and living God. And they repented. They gave themselves to God. They said, Lord, whatever thy will be, you know, whatever it is, but we serve you. We will give our, we give our life to you because we realize we messed up. I believe that Korah, Datham, and Abiram and all these men, if they would have repented, if they would have turned from their ways, they would not have been destroyed the way they were. They would have been brought back into the favor with God. Because God, it says if we come to God in repentance, He will forgive us. True repentance, that is, which is a forsaking of our sins. That sentence that was put upon them, even if they died, they could have died in peace and in rest. Let's say, even they say they could have said, "Okay, God, we understand this. You know, we've we've been stiff-necked people. We've really, really dishonored you. We have we have really messed up bad. And you know what? Even if we die, so be it. But you know what? We're still going to serve you. We're still going to serve you. We're going to love you. We're going to we're going to surrender our hearts to you. And we do that. You know what? Even if their bodies died, they would have had eternal life. What is the life that's important? The physical life or the eternal life? It doesn't matter. These bodies don't mean nothing. It doesn't matter if we die tomorrow. As long as we've done the work that God has called us to do, so be it. Whatever, whatever it takes. The life that we should be cherishing, brethren, is not the physical life. It is the spiritual life, the eternal life that God has given us in Christ. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 397, paragraph 3, says that the charge that the murmurings of the people have brought upon them, the wrath of God, was declared to be a mistake. They said that the congregation were not at fault since they desired nothing more than their rights, but that Moses was an overbearing ruler, that he had reproved the people as sinners when they were a holy people, and the Lord was among them. You know, many of us say the same thing today. Even though we're living in sin. We could be living in sin, cherishing sin, and you know, we're the holy people. We're the holy people of God. We have to be careful, brethren. Holiness is only found in Christ, and if we're covered by Christ because we have surrendered to Him, then, and even then, we will not be so blatant to be claiming such blatant things. We would humble ourselves and say, listen, I, <laughs> let God be glorified. I'm nothing. I'm, I'm the chief of sinners. Paul said, I am the chief of sinners. But how many people, oh no, we're holy. We are the people. We're the remnant. We're the, you know, we have to be humble, brethren. God has people everywhere. And those are the ones that are surrendered to God. Those that have truly surrendered everything are not holding on to sin. They're not, they're not living in sin as if it's, it's okay and then claiming to be holy. No, this is, this is a deception. We don't want to be falling into the trap of the deception of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 397, paragraph 4, says that Korah reviewed his, the history of their travels through the wilderness, 
where they had been brought into straight places. And many had perished because of their murmurings and disobedience. His hearers thought they saw clearly that their troubles might have been prevented if Moses had pursued a different course. They decided that all their disasters were chargeable to him and that their exclusion from Canaan was in consequence of the mismanagement of Moses and Aaron. You know, brethren, even today, even in our own circles, we have Korahs, Dathans, and Abirams doing the same thing. Blaming everything upon the leaders that are actually bringing the truth to the people. This is always going to happen. You see, this is why we're told by the wise man in Ecclesiastes that that which has been will be. There's nothing new under the sun. There's always going to be, before Christ comes, two people, two classes of people. Those who are really God's people and those who are like Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Those who profess to be, but in reality, they're actually agents of Satan. You see, they brought these charges against God's truly anointed. God's anointed, they were bringing charges against. They brought charges against Moses, charges against Aaron, you know, all of these people. So the, the question has to be, to what did Korah attribute the miracles worked through Moses then? Because there was many miracles that came through Moses. There's much evidence that God is using certain brethren or certain people in this world, certain uh, people that God is using as mouthpieces. But what, what did Korah attribute the miracles that were worked through Moses? To who or to what? Notice in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 404, paragraph 4. To what did Korah attribute the miracles worked through Moses? Let us see. This is what it says. But Korah and his companions rejected light until they became so blinded that the most striking manifestations of God's power were not sufficient to convince them. They attributed them all, all of the miracles, all of the uh, things that were worked through to these men. They attributed them all to human or satanic agency. Think about that. These men were now charging the anointed of the Lord as doing miracles through satanic agencies. What's that called in the Bible, by the way, when we attribute the miracles of God to Satan? Isn't it called the blaspheming of the Holy Spirit? Also, we're blaspheming against God, isn't it? Notice here at Review and Herald, November 12th, 1903, what it says. Korah and his fellow conspirators were men who had, brought, who had been favored with special manifestations of God's power and greatness. They were of the number who went up with Moses into the mount and beheld the divine glory. But since that time, a change had come. A temptation, slight at first, had been harbored and had strengthened as it was encouraged until their minds were controlled by Satan and they ventured upon their work of dissatisfaction, a disaffection. Professing great interest in the prosperity of the people, they first whispered their discontent to one another, and then to leading men of Israel. Their insinuations were so readily received that they ventured still further. In other words, it gave them fuel in their fire, because these insinuations were so readily received that they ventured still further, and at last, they really believed themselves to be actuated by zeal for God. Doesn't the Bible say that many will kill God's people, thinking they're doing God a, a service? This is the mind that had now been uh, solidified in Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Through jealousy and a refusal to accept the sentence that they all would die in the wilderness because of their sin, Korah and his companions blamed Moses for mismanaging everything and accusing him of working through human or satanic power. As we notice, Korah attributed the manifestations of divine glory, even the divine glory on the mountain that, uh, uh, of Horeb, to satanic or human origin and not from God. These lies revealed that they were fully controlled by Satan. 
As Korah was seeking the priesthood, he attacked and sought to undermine confidence in Aaron as the high priest. Korah met with great success, we're told. The people were very happy to believe that it was not their fault that they were in strife, but rather that it was the fault of Moses and Aaron. You know, many of us do that too. We always say, we, we, we think that it's, it's not our fault that, that uh, you know, we can't get victory even in many things. Or because uh, a lot of bad things happen, we say, no, it's not our fault, you know, because we're good people. We're the holy people of God. When in reality, many times, many times it is our fault. It is our fault. Matter of fact, everything that we see around us is our fault. Why? Because we have sinned. We have sinned. But when we give our life to God, we will learn to trust and rest in Him because we know that He has everything in control if we have given Him full legal authority. Now, Testimony Volume 3, page 345, paragraph 2, says, There is nothing which will please the people better than to be praised and flattered when they are in darkness and wrong and deserve reproof. Korah gained the ears of the people and next their sympathies by representing Moses as an overbearing leader. He said that he was too harsh too exacting, too dictatorial, and that he reproved the people as though they were sinners when they were a holy people sanctified to the Lord, and the Lord was among them. Korah rehearsed the incidents in their experience in their travels through the wilderness, where they had been brought into straight places, and where many of them had died because of murmuring and disobedience, and with their perverted senses they thought they saw very clearly that all their trouble might have been saved if Moses had pursued a different course. He was too unyielding, too exacting, and they decided that all their disasters in the wilderness were chargeable to him. Korah, the leading spirit, professed great wisdom in discerning the true reason for their trials and afflictions. Now, it goes on to say in page uh, 346, Paragraph 1, that in this work of disaffection, there was greater harmony and union of views and feelings among these discordant elements than had ever been known to exist before. I want to pause for a second there. That's something for us to digest. Think about that again. In this work of disaffection, there was greater harmony, union of views, and feelings among these discordant elements than had ever been known to exist before. You know, if God's people could only uh, unite like they did, but in positive uh, attributes, this work would be finished and wrapped up by now. Think about that. The wickedness, they have no trouble uniting uh, you know, their affection, their feelings, you know, their views. They have no problem many times. But what about us? Claim to be God's remnant last day church. Are we uniting in our views and feelings? Are we coming into harmony? Well, I, I hope so. And you know what? The signs that we see going around us are telling us that it's happening gradually. So praise God. God's church, the invisible church, is coming together gradually into the same views, into union of feelings and harmony. Praise God. Let us be among those that have this experience because we don't want to be on the wrong side because it's easier for the wicked, I think, than it would be for the righteous because the righteous... They have to come over, get over their own selves. But these give in to self, and that's what brings it all together for them. Notice here, Korah's success in gaining the larger part of the congregation of Israel on his side led him to feel confident that he was wise and correct in judgment, and that Moses was indeed usurping authority that threatened the prosperity and salvation of Israel. He claimed that God had opened the matter to him, so he was being led by God in his mind. God has revealed to me 
You ever had people do that? God has shown me that this is the way when they're in complete error. This is what was happening to Korah. He claimed that God had opened the matter to him and laid, it, laid upon him the burden of changing the government of Israel just before it was too late. He stated that the congregation were not at fault. They were righteous. That this great cry about the murmuring of the congregation bringing upon them the wrath of God was all a mistake. And that the people only wanted to have their rights. They wanted individual independence. Wow. Brethren, the accusations continued from Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, especially Korah, who's the leader. These accusations, they continued and continued as Moses requested Dathan and Abiram to come to him. He saw that he was having trouble reaching Korah. Korah was not listening. Korah was not hearing the pleadings of God. He said, let me try to call Dathan and Abiram at least. Maybe they'll hear. You know, think about what Moses was doing here. Moses was trying to, he's being used by God to win these brethren. Who was the one that was inspiring Moses to try to win them, to try to save them from the destruction just ahead? It was God. Just like we read in, in 1 Peter, I believe it is, where Christ went to the antediluvians to, to touch their hearts. Even for 120 years, he was preaching to them through, through a... Um, uh, <laughs> slipping my mind through uh, well, huh? Noah. huh? Noah. to Noah how did I slip on that one through Noah he was preaching for 120 years through Noah and they rejected him they rejected him the same thing here we see Moses doing Moses is preaching to try to prevent this thing from happening just like God was preaching through Noah. Notice here in Numbers 16, verses 12 to 14. And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, which said, we will not come up. Notice what they said. Isn't that the same thing that the antediluvians did? They were, they were rejecting and rejecting and rejecting until they sealed themselves off completely. And what happened? Nothing else God could do for them. Notice here, we will not come up. Is it a small thing that thou has brought us up out of the land that floweth with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness, except thou make thyself altogether a prince over us? This was their response. Moreover, thou hast not brought us into the land that flows with milk and honey, or given us inheritance or fields or and vineyards. Will thou put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. This was the response of Dathan, Dathan and Abiram. Testimonies, Volume 3, page 346, paragraph 2, says, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram must assign some reason before the people why Moses had from the first shown so great an interest for the congregation of Israel. Now they were going to say, well, it seemed as if Moses had good, uh, good uh, intentions for us in the beginning, right? Now they have to assign some reason before the people, why Moses had from the first shown so great an interest for the congregation of Israel. It goes on to say, Their selfish minds, which had been debased as Satan's instruments, suggested that they had at last found out the object of the apparent interest of Moses. So now they're saying, we, we think we understand why Moses seemed to be interested in the beginning. Notice what they say here. He had designed to keep them wandering in the wilderness. This was their thought. He had, that Moses had designed to keep them wandering in the wilderness until they all or nearly all should perish and he should come into possession of their property. Think about that, brethren. These men were, you know, they were called to be instruments of God, you know. But now they're clearly instruments of Satan. And they accused the patient and selfless Moses who was pleading for their salvation with completely selfish motives. You know, I want to just point out a fact here is that, you know, Moses was human. You know, he had also a carnal nature that was being suppressed by the Holy Spirit. But 
this deeply wounded Moses. It really did. It deeply wounded his heart because he had sacrificed everything for the cause of God. And, you know, this is how these brethren were now, you know, coming against him. You know, in Numbers chapter 16, verse, and we're going to see this a little bit as we go forward because um, we're going to see something that Moses did, which was not exactly what God would have desired. But, you know, he was a faulty human being like we are. We make a lot of mistakes all the time. And um, so we don't want to hold that against Mo, uh, Moses. But notice here, we're going to look at something here in Numbers chapter 16, verse 15. And it kind of gives us a clue as to this little, let's say, I don't know if you want to call it a mishap, but, you know, a defect that came up and rose up in Moses. Notice in Numbers 16, 15, Moses was very wroth. But we're going to see what that means. It doesn't really mean angry. We're going to see that Moses had a tender heart. But he did something later on, which we're going to look at, that kind of wasn't exactly what, you know, would have been God's ideal. But this, we're going to see what this word wrath means. It doesn't mean he was angry. We're going to see that. So Moses was very wroth and said unto the Lord, Respect not thou their offering. I have not taken one ass from them, neither have I hurt one of them. Now he was, even though he was wounded, we're going to see what that word wrath really means. Because Moses was really grieved at the charges. That's, you know, remember Moses was the meekest man. You know, we're told that Moses was the meekest man on earth. So that means you could take, uh, you know, you could take wounds. You know, it was to be meek is a person that doesn't respond with, against evil with evil. It responds towards evil with good. That's what it really means to be meek, right? So Moses was the meekest man. So we're going to see what this means. So, but, but Moses was very grieved. This is what it really means. Notice uh, now, the, now the text says that Moses was wroth. Right? But the Hebrew word can also be translated as grieved. And we're going to see that now. Notice Samuel's reaction to Saul. We're going to look at a, uh, another example using that same word, by the way. Notice Samuel's reaction to Saul using the same Hebrew word. Remember, the Hebrew original is a certain word that maybe differs from the, the, uh, the, 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 the common English word that we use today, the contemporary word that we use to describe those same emotions. But notice here, Samuel's reaction to Saul using the same Hebrew word. In 1 Samuel 15, 11, here it is. Notice here, it repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he's turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. This is the word now. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. That word there, and it grieved Samuel, is the same word used in number 1615 when it says, and Moses was very wroth. So the word wroth really means grieved in the original Hebrew. Now, notice that Ellen White says that Moses was greatly moved rather than angry, thus confirming the interpretation of grieved for the word wroth in the scripture. Notice here, Testimony Volume 3 page 348 paragraph 2 it says Moses was greatly moved at these unjust accusations and notice what he does he appealed to God before the people whether he had ever acted arbitrary and implored him to be his judge the people in general were disaffected and influenced by the mis uh, misrepresentations of Korah so here we see Moses was entering into the sufferings of Christ. The actions of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram were a cruel, were such a cruel work, inspired by Satan, which uh, developed out uh, in Korah. And, 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 and if you think about it now, this also was the same principle that developed in Satan in heaven. So the actions of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram were a cruel work inspired by Satan, developed out of his own experience in heaven with the Son of God. In Numbers 16, verses 16 to 19, it says this, it goes on with the story, and it says, Moses said unto Korah, Be thou and all thy company before the Lord, thou and they and Aaron tomorrow, and take every man his censer, and put incense in them. And bring ye before the Lord every man his censer, 
250 censers, thou also and Aaron, each of you his censer. And they took every man his censer and put fire in them and laid incense thereon and stood in the door of the tabernacle of the congregation with Moses and Aaron. And Korah gathered all the congregation against them unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the congregation. Now, this is a spectacular event now. The glory of the Lord now appears to the congregation. Every man has his censer. They got fire in the censers. They're all standing there at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the Lord appears. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 399, paragraph 3. Now remember, you know, well, let's just go, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Let's look at Patriarchs and Prophets, 399, paragraph 3. Notice here. They accused Moses of pretending to act under divine guidance as a means of establishing his authority. And they declared that they would no longer submit to be led about like blind men. Now toward Canaan and now toward the wilderness as best suited his ambitious designs. Thus he who had been as a tender father, a patient shepherd, was represented in the blackest character of a tyrant and usurper. The exclusion from Canaan in punishment of their own sins was charged upon him. Remember, this is their mindset, but now they're, they're standing before the Lord and the glory of the Lord appears. Now, after all Moses had done for the children of Israel, the scripture says that all of the congregation were gathered together against himself and Aaron. Remember that this was a cross for Moses. He was now carrying a burden. He had a burden for these brethren. He loved them. But let us note carefully what happens next in Numbers 16, verses 20 and 21. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. Notice what it said. That I may consume them. But notice there's, a, there's, a, there's another term there, separate yourself. So there's now a separation going to take a place between God and His people and the wicked and their God. We're going to see this as we continue. But it uses the term that I may consume them in a moment. We know that as we've studied the Hebrew idiom of permission and um, figures of speech found in the Bible, we can understand what these things mean. They don't mean God is going to consume them literally to, into, into destruction, but there's a separation going to be taking place here. We're going to see this as we get further along in this study. So this is a very similar statement, by the way, to what God said in regard to the sin of the golden calf in Exodus chapter 32, verse 10. Notice what it says in Exodus chapter 32, verse 10. The same thing, that I may consume them. Notice here. Exodus 32, 10 says, Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them, that, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. So the Lord used the same language to Moses before, right? When Moses was in, was, uh, in the mount, right? He was saying, let me consume them. But the Lord had a purpose in this type of land. God was speaking to Moses. He, was, he, might have, he, he would have been speaking to him on his own level, right? But he had a purpose in this. Why was God saying this? What was the Lord's purpose in using this type of language when he spake to, in other words, this imperfect language that God was using. Remember, there's quotations that tell us God uses imperfect language to meet imperfect beings like us. So, the principle here has to be applied. God is using imperfect language because we're going to see how this all played out as we continue to study in this top in this study. But what was the Lord's purpose? So let's look at what the Lord's purpose in using that type of language before Moses was. Notice here in uh, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 245, paragraph 1. God proposed to Moses to consume them and to make of him, Moses, a great nation. Right? Here the Lord proved Moses. He was proving Moses. He knew that it was a, la a laborious and soul-trying work 
to lead that rebellious people through to the promised land. He would test the perseverance, faithfulness, and love of Moses for such an erring and ungrateful people. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 245, Paragraph 1. In Review and Herald, February 11th, 1909, Paragraph 5, it reiterates this. God used this imperfect language to prove or test or to bring something out of Moses that was needful at the time. Notice here in Review and Herald, Moses was tested with the promise of great honor. The Lord would place him at the head of a great nation. But notice what it says now. Had Moses possessed a narrow, selfish spirit, how quickly he would have grasped such an offer. But he would not listen to the promise of preferment. Think about that. Wow, how many of us, being in that position, would have responded like Moses? Wow, was he really a humble, meek servant? I would say so. The Lord says, let me move them out of the way for you, Moses, and let me exalt you. And Moses says, no. Moses would not listen to the promise of preferment. In this test, brethren, for Moses was the principle of the cross. What did Satan come and tell Jesus? Let me exalt you, give you all the kingdoms of the world. What did Jesus says? No. No. What about when he told him, get off the, you should get off the cross. You're going to be, you're going to be, you're so polluted with sin that you're not even going to ever resurrect again. He says, does it matter? Does it matter? I will die for my people that they may live. This, was the, this is why Moses was a type of Christ, by the way. Moses was willing to die and to lower himself so that his people could live. Wow. Even those his people that were in rebellion, in, you know, that were doing wickedness. I mean, there's one thing to say, well, I will die for my uh, holy people, the people that are, are God's people that are living in obedience. You know, you know those that are good people. You know, they're 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 living in obedience. They have the goodness of God in them. There's another thing to say. I will die for my people who are living in rebellion, who are stiff-necked, those who are not doing good things. I will die for them. Wow, that is not Moses, brethren. That is the spirit of Christ. That is the mind of Christ in Moses. Here we see a type of Christ in Moses. Moses chose to allow his flesh to be crucified with Christ. Praise the Lord. You know, we also see this important point in the crucifixion. In uh, Faith I Live By, page 104, paragraph 7, it says, God permits his son, Jesus, to be delivered up for our offenses. He himself assumes towards the sin bearer the character of a judge, divesting himself of the endearing qualities of a father. Think about that. With careful consideration, we can see that whenever, wherever the judgments of God take place, brethren, the cross is erected. I want you to think about that again. Wherever we see the judgments of God taking place, there's a cross erected. The previous statement that we read in Numbers 16.21 appears to show us a very firm judge. But let's consider the following statement in Great Controversy, page 652, paragraph 1. Our God is not a stern judge. He's a judge. But we have to understand in what context and how it is that people receive judgments coming upon them. Is it that God is proactively opening up the earth to swallow human beings and then crush them in with the earth so that they can die a horrendous death of suffocation? Is this our God? Or is there a cross erected in which He's pleading with them, but at the same time, He has to respect human choice? 
Great Controversy 652 paragraph 1 says, The mystery of the cross explains all other mysteries. All, that means including the mystery of this, what happens here, because there was a cross erected here when we see, in every place where we see judgment. So the mystery of the cross has to also explain judgment to us, brethren. The mystery of the cross explains all us the other mysteries, and judgment is a great mystery. Matter of fact, I heard a, a, a prominent pastor the other day call it the 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 uh, he called it the the uh, uh, the strange act of God, and we're studying the strange act of God on Tuesdays here. But many ministers around the world call the, these things that happen upon the wicked as God's strange act, as if God. And I mean it in the context. They mean it in the context as if God Himself is now destroying them when He Himself doesn't have any bone of destruction in Him. Even though He says, Thou shalt not destroy, in the sense when He says, Thou shalt not kill, He's saying, Thou shalt not destroy. Because to kill is to destroy. So when He says, Thou shalt not kill, in the Sixth Commandment, He's saying, Thou shalt not destroy. But yet, they consider destruction as coming from God as His strange act where God now has to Turn away from his divine prerogatives to behave like humans do in destroying one another. He has to use the human mechanisms of justice. What happens when you go to prison for murder? They murder you. They have to break the law in order to enforce the law. So here, pastors all across the world are painting God out as if he does the same thing. Therefore, we must justify ourselves when we have to murder somebody too. Or kill somebody. Because there are enemies. But what happened with love your enemies then? This is a mystery. It could be confusing to many people. But we're told here that the mystery of the cross explains all other mysteries. In the light that streams from Calvary, the attributes of God which had filled us with fear and awe appear beautiful and attractive. Mercy, tenderness, and parental love are seen to blend with holiness, justice, and power. Praise the Lord. Was it God who inflicted all of the pain and the wounds upon Christ? No, it was man. It was man, brethren. Who nailed him to the cross? Men did. Who scourged his back? Men did. Who caused all the pain upon sin did wasn't God so what do we see here at the cross the mystery of the cross explaining to us the attributes of God Israel had deeply wounded Moses and at this moment the spirit of Christ in Moses responded to the test through the statement to consume the congregation the law was entering to cause sin to abound in their consciences Yet on this point, Moses chose to die to self in Christ. And grace did much more abound in him and Aaron in the following way found in Numbers chapter 16, verse 22, when it says, And they fell upon their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin and will thou be wroth with all the congregation? They were crying out to God on behalf of the congregation. They knew probably by that point that there was nothing more that could be done for Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. But they were pleading now for the congregation. They pleaded for Korah. They pleaded with Dathan. They pleaded with Abiram. They tried to plead with all these men that went on their side. But now they're saying, Lord, we must plead for the congregation. How precious is the Spirit of Christ when we see it in human hearts, isn't it? Oh, let that be our experience, brethren. We see Christ interceding in Moses and Aaron to the Father. And this is just as the Father desired it. This is why He used that imperfect language to draw this type of response from them. For He doesn't wish any to perish, brethren, but that all should come to repentance. Isn't that what the Bible tells us? We know for certain while Israel deserved to be consumed, our Father did not desire this from this following statement that we're going to read now, which was taken, which was uh, uh, regarding a little later in the story. Notice here, Review and Herald, no, November 12, 1903. Um, 
Art B, paragraph 26. Notice what it says. Jesus, the angel who went before the Hebrews, sought to save them from destruction. I'm going to read that again. Jesus, the angel, angel means messenger again, so let's not be confused with these words, right? So I'm going to read it with the real meaning. Jesus the messenger, right? Jesus the messenger who went before the Hebrews sought to save them from destruction. Forgiveness was lingering for them. The judgment of God had come very near and appealed to them to repent. A special irresistible interference from heaven had arrested their rebellion. Now, if they would respond to the interposition of God's providence, they might be saved God always gives us opportunities until there is no more uh, we close our minds completely to any uh, uh, any uh, to any opportunity basically we close our mind to any hope and any opportunity because we seal ourselves off from God's protection remember he has angels holding back the winds so that they don't blow on us we have the protection of God promised us if we receive it. We have to receive Jesus Christ, brethren. When we receive it, we receive all of the protection of heaven. Doesn't mean bad things won't be permitted to come into our life, but they will be permitted for a reason, for a cause. We might not understand the cause at the time, but rest assured it is for a cause. And in heaven, it will be revealed to us for all those things that we thought were so trying and difficult and may have even been curses in our life. We were going to see that they were among the greatest blessings of our life. We will see that. It's guaranteed. Remain faithful, brethren. We will see that. It will be revealed. The books will be opened. You see, brethren, the judgment of God to consume the congregation drew out of Moses and Aaron the spirit of intercession to save the people. The Father said, uh, He said this through the language of the Old Covenant in order to draw from Moses and Aaron the intercession according to the New Covenant that would be give Israel more time to repent. In other words, He used Old Covenant language. Right? God used Old Covenant language. says, step aside that I may consume them. Right? Like human attributes. What is Old Covenant? It's human promises. Human behavior. That's the carnal nature. That's really what the Old Covenant is. What is the New Covenant? It's faith. It's trusting in divine, the divine attributes of God. It's, it's, it's Jesus Christ. It's having Him. Right? New Covenant. It's having faith. Opposed to having works of, car, of a carnal nature. It's works of a divine nature. Right? It's not even where It's faith. It's a divine faith. So, what did God do? He used Old Covenant language in order to draw from Moses and Aaron the intercession according to the new covenant uh, faith that would give Israel more time to repent. Numbers 16, 23 and 26 continues to say, it says, The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up from about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan and Abiram. And Moses rose up and went unto Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel uh, followed him. And he spake unto the congregation and saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men. By this point, he now calls them wicked men. That means he knows now that they are they're done. There is no more that he can do for them. That's why he was now pleading for the congregation. But notice what he tells them to the congregation. He spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, in other words, separate. Doesn't that the Bible tell us, Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Right? The Lord wants us to come out of what? Babylon. Come out of the Babylonian mindset. Come out from a... This is the same thing we see Moses now preaching to the congregation. It says he spake. But you know what? Let's use that. Preaching. He was preaching to the congregation saying, Come out from among them. Depart, I pray you, from the tents of Babylon, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch not their tents. Touch not the unclean thing, lest ye be consumed in all their sins. Amazing. Amazing, brethren. Patriarchs and prophets 
401 paragraph 2 says, When Moses was entreating Israel to flee from the coming destruction, the divine judgment might even then have been stayed. Listen to that carefully. When Moses was entreating Israel to flee from the coming destruction, the divine judgment might even then have been stayed if Korah and his company had repented and sought forgiveness. But their stubborn persistence sealed their doom. The entire congregation were sharers in their guilt. For all had, to a greater or lesser degree, sympathized with them. Yet God, in His great mercy, made a distinction between the leaders in rebellion and those whom they had led. Praise God! This is why it's very critical when you're a leader. When you're a leader, you're at, you're at, you have higher responsibilities, brethren. You know, you can't just be living uh, haphazardly. You know, you, you have to be seriously consecrated to God. It is a great and terrible thing to be called a leader. And God has called us to be leaders, brethren, every one of us. Every one of us are called to be leaders. We're all called to be priests for God, all of us. But notice that there was a distinction. God in His mercy, in His great mercy, made a distinction between the leaders in rebellion and those whom, he had, whom the leaders had led. So what happened to Korah, Dath, and, Ab and Abiram? They perished, brethren. They perished. I think I'm going to save that for next week. Let's look at this week as an introduction to what happened to Korah, Dath, and Abiram. I'm going to leave you on a cliffhanger this week. I know you're probably going to be mad at me. Hopefully there's no stones around right now. But next week, we're going to, we're going to, get, to get into the physical mechanism behind how Korah, Dathan, and Abiram actually perished. So I'm going to invite you right now to think about everything that we've heard, you know, because it's really a message of introspection, this first half or this first part of this presentation. An introspection. God has called us to be leaders. How are we behaving? Are we behaving like business as usual? Or are we really considering our calling? If you have not given yourself to Christ today, if you feel like you have been clinging on to sin, or you're still in a rut because of sin, and you want to be freed, today is the day to surrender and give everything to God so that you give Him full legal authority in your life he wants to be your all and all he wants to be your protector the problem is sin causes a separation and many evils fall upon us that are unnecessary because God cannot protect we can see in this first half of this message God was pleading with Korah he wanted to save him he was pleading with Dathan he was pleading with Abiram he pleads with us today he's pleading with you today Brethren, he's pleading with me. Let us surrender all and, and let us not allow ourselves to continue under the rulership and enslavement, enslavement of sin. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for this presentation. Truly, you are opening up to our minds some serious things, Lord. You are preparing us for the judgments that are coming upon the earth soon that will finally cleanse the earth Help us, dear God, to surrender all to you. Give us that extra nudge. Let your Holy Spirit be felt in our life. May we hear your voice clearly speaking to us today. We pray, dear God, that you will continue to guide our footsteps. And you continue to be merciful to us, Lord. Lord God, thank you. We praise your holy name. We thank you for Jesus and what happened at the cross, which reveals to us the mysteries of of your character help us to know what that means help us to continue to, to to attend to studies like these so that we can get a deeper understanding for how can we be led if we don't have if we don't allow your you to minister to us through through the your ministers dear father we thank you we praise you we are not worthy of you but we 
We thank you for your grace and your mercy. Continue to be gracious unto us, Lord, as we continue on with the remainder of this day. Continue to bless us. Continue to draw us near to Christ. And continue to draw us near to each other because we know that the wicked are drawing together in bundles. Even though they don't realize it, they're, they're drawing in bundles, getting ready to burn in the anguish of a guilty conscience. But Lord, help us to be drawing in bundles. In, in bundles that will bring you glory and honor. Bring us together in that brotherly love that we may become Philadelphians. But we know this is your will. And we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, brethren.